video equipment rental cost paid for by peep code screencasts. All right, good afternoon everybody. So I'm gonna be talking about yet another DSL. Um, this one is, we're gonna, will help you uh, do parsing. So let me just first tell you kind of uh, history of uh, how, I got, how I got to here where if, that uh, I wrote this package. So in the past, I'm sure many of you in the same boat where you've written all these uh, possibly custom parsers, handcrafted, um, typically they're maybe uh, what the, the typical term might be called uh, recursive descent, but unfortunately they were in Perl. Um, later on, then I was getting tired of that, so went to some uh, different tools. One of them was Antler for doing parser generation. Still wasn't good enough. So I was um, wanting to, what I was wanting to find was a uh, parser generator that would um, one use use the same language that you're generating the parser with, instead of having this separate side file where you have uh, BNF or whatever, I wanted it to be in the same language that you're dealing with. Um, I also wanted something that would unify um, the lexer and the parser together. Um, everything else I found like, uh, rack, including rack, yak, and lex, antler included, they were, separate, they were separate beasts. So I was kind of wanting to make something unified with that. Um, and I, was act I actually searched for, I was looking for a language that might help me do that. So I actually, that's, this is why I learned Ruby. And so I came to this because Ruby has kind of the right mix for doing it. O operator overloading, blocks, duct typing, all of these make it work very well. And um, this is actually my fourth, my fourth rewrite of this, of this package. So first of all, I just wanted to show you how um, the grammar works to make a parser, to parse, to parse uh, whatever, whatever language you, you need to. Um, so in, in this, what you start with are these grammar objects. So grammar is actually, it's just, it's just a Ruby object. That's, that's all it is. It's just an, a Ruby object that holds information for a grammar of something. So to build a grammar of something, some language that you want to parse, you build it piecemeal. You build it starting from the lowest level and build up. And all you do is use simply regular old Ruby operators and methods throw in a few blocks to get your actions in, and that's how you build your grammar up. So it's, and so you get this, this grammar out here, and then, which is just a representation of what you want, of the language you want to parse. And then, then um, you have, I have what I'm calling an engine, a grammar engine, that will take that grammar and then generate something more concrete, a parser, and that, that is the thing that will parse, parse your input. So I have this layer between the grammar and the thing that, that, um, that understands the, the final parsing at the end. But this, this whole thing, this is just Ruby objects and methods. So if you want to contrast this to um, what most people use for parsing typically is our regular expressions. So just gives a, a, a table showing equivalence between um, regular expressions. So the thing on the left, regular expressions, are these are symbols, operations that you use within a string, basically. So you have a string that has these, these uh, operations that you combine um, pieces of regular expressions together to create a bigger regular expression. And then with grammar, on the other hand, this is just straight Ruby. It's not, you don't put this in a string or file, it's just straight Ruby. Just a, it's a DSL that um, uses, like 
uh, regular expression, we have a uh, vertical bar to mean alternation. I use the vertical, the or operator in Ruby to accomplish that. I use plus to accomplish a sequence. I use a, here a positive to accomplish a, a, a positive look ahead assertion or a negative look ahead assertion. Um, so then, and then at the top here um, is kind of the, the leaves of your grammar that you start with to build up. So characters, a uh, character range. I'm going to talk a little bit about the input sequence. Um, the input sequence, um, it can be anything, really. Um, it, all it, has, it just has to be, uh, look like an, an external iterator, which I'm, I'm using this uh, the brackets method to basically get the next item in the sequence. And the items in that sequence could be anything. Characters. Typically, if you want to compare it to regular expressions, but they could also be tokens. If you want to do a parser that uses uh, results from, from Lexing. Um, and then at the, at the lowest level, this, um, this grammar called element, which I abbreviate as E from the previous slide, it's kind of the, it, it takes these, um, these tokens out of, the, out of the stream and compares them with a pattern that you give. And it just uses this triple equal method um, to do that. And again, it can, the, the pattern can be anything. It just needs to work together with whatever's in the input stream. And then we have a few more um, leaves of the, of the grammar there. On the other end, the output of this, um, when, for a lot of other parser generators, they'll generate um, abstract syntax trees. I think for the way I do parsing, maybe a better description um, from the approach I have might be an abstract syntax forest. And so instead of it, the, um, the, par the each grammar parsing to a, a tree, it, it could generate just a sequence of things. So or you could just call it an output stream. This just generates a stream of things. And the default is that the output stream is exactly like the input stream. And you use different methods to do different things. So this, this discard method, you apply it to any grammar, it all of a sudden starts throwing away the, throwing it, throwing away the input rather than putting it, putting it in, the, in the output stream. Um, you can redirect to a buffer and then a temporary buffer, then have a block do whatever you want it to. There's group, and that's a basically just a specific version of redirect that groups to a buffer and then appends to the output. So the group is kind of how you would create hierarchy. You create your abstract syntax tree. So at this point, I think I want to go ahead and just give some simple examples, just a couple. So here's a, a unit test of, of grammar. I don't know if that's, is that readable? OK, so um, I just, I'm just, it's at the top here, I'm just creating a few helper methods. Down here um, is this input method that I'm using to get into the form I need for my, imp, my uh, input iterator. So to convert a string into a string I.O. And you get this get C method. It gives you back something that looks like a lambda that I use for, for getting, the next, um, getting the next token in my input string, which is in this case, I'm just going to use uh, characters in a string. So this first example, um, all I'm doing here is just parsing a single digit. And so this is how you would generate that. The grammar is just that first line there, just setting to a single element that rat matches a character in that character range, 0 through 9. And then here's a few, <clears throat> a few examples here, just parsing, parsing out the first digit in this string. And here I'm 
uh, I'm appending to the previous output. That's why it has both there, the one and two. And then it just shows a few invalid conditions. So we build on that. And we just say a, a sequence of digits. Well, we just apply this. I have a method called repeat one that does, does one or more digits. And then I can parse that. Th this time I also said digits plus EOF. So it has, so that's why this, this case here um, ga gives an error because A, it's not an EOF at that point. So let me go, go back. I'll show you a few more examples a little later. So another thing you can do with, with your grammars, you can also take the output of one grammar and connect it to the input of another. And you, you can do that because um, grammar is kind of agnostic about what's going, what's in these input and outputs, these input and output streams. So any grammar could act, be acting as like parser or lexer or whatever you want to call it. So you, I have one method here, supply, which takes um, the grammar for a single token and that it uses that to form a, le a lexer and it connects that to, to a parser, um, another, another which is represented by another grammar. And then pipe, similarly except this one does some multi-threading. So we can do a multi-threaded uh, lexer parser combination. And what it's doing there is it, it puts, instead of the input and output to the two um, grammars, it's using a producer-consumer pipe to, to connect, connect lexer and parser. But um, we can also go beyond that, too. You can, you can do as much chaining as you want. You could, you could have a... Uh, a preprocessor that feeds a lexer, that feeds a parser, that you could do something, and, or even a compiler after that. It just, each step just basically takes an input stream and generates an output stream. And it's just, it gets refined to what, how, what, whatever you want to do with it. So I wanted to talk about what kind of the category of, of the, and the, the type of parser that this thing is. Um, it's called an LL parser. Um, if, if any of you have written your own parser, um, those typically will just parse from left to right. And those are also, those are also LL parsers. So, I, so I'm basically generating a parser that basically looks like what you would write by hand. Um, but it does do one character at a time, which you might write by hand would be looking at maybe uh, using regular expressions, so it might look a little further in front. Um, but I do, I do have a backdoor on that restriction that it look one character at a time, and it's called backtrack. And basically, you, take, you can take any grammar and you use the backtrack method on it, and it and it effectively looks like, at that point, a single token when, it's in its part, when it does its parsing decision. So it gives you an infinite look ahead capability at that point. Recursion. So this is, this is one of the more interesting parts of, of grammar. Um, so this is. This is how one, one way for, for creating a recursive grammar. Um, you, so inner, inner and outer kind of represent the same grammar. It's just different parts. So this is in, inner represents inside the recursion, and outside is the final thing. So um, you, you call it this way, and, and whenever it would hit inner, that would represent a reference back to the, the entire thing again. So, um, but in addition to that, I look at where inner is to, to make some optimizations. So if inner is in the middle of 
of a sequence of parsing. It's just, it just uses plain old recursion to recall the grammar again to do more parsing. If it's on the right side and there's nothing that occurs after it, then I'm, I do something that creates a loop around there. And that's equivalent to what uh, compilers would do called tail call optimization. So I eliminate these, these extra recursive loops, which would, if I didn't do that, that would cause the stack to blow up when you're, when you're parsing. And so it creates a, a pretty significant speed benefit. The last one, <clears throat> left recursion, when it occurs on the left side, it also implies a loop. Um, this one's kind of interesting because uh, historically, left recursion is, has only been in the domain of things, of parsers like RAC or YAC that are called, uh, I believe, LALR parsers. Uh, mine is an LL parser, though. And, but I'm still doing left recursion, which is, um, I believe there was, there's only um, one other parser that I've seen do left recursion that's LL. So it's, this is this is uh, is quite unique, um, and this just shows you an, an example of how I do it. Um, I start if you start with a, a grammar like this, what I do is I break it into two pieces. I, I look at I look at that grammar that grammar twice. The first time I substitute it with a failure, which is going to cause it this part to to fail, and I just get this part. The y, the y part. And then the second time I'll, I look at this, I treat the inner as always passing. And then it gets x. And then I put a loop around it. So this, this first one gets boiled down into the equivalent of the, the last one. So typically, most LL parsers, you would, you would have to write it like the last point. But in this, LL parser, you could, you could write your grammar as left, as left recursion, which is a lot of times the most natural way to write things. I mean, even a simple expression, which I'll show you, it's, it's more natural to write left recursion. <clears throat> OK, so now go to this example. So let's go back to this uh, digits example. I'll expand on that a little bit. And first of all, I'll go ahead and add in um, pre previously, let me go back here. So previously, um, when we parse this 2, 3 here, um, it, it came out just simply as two characters, two, the character 2 and the character 3. It's not really that useful to us that we're just doing that. So, what we'd really like is it to convert it to an integer instead of just still characters. So in this example here, I'm, I just added this uh, group method. So that causes it to shove the results of the parsing of that grammar into a string. That's, I gave it a string there. And then it gives a string to a block. And in this case, I'm converting it to an integer. Convert the string to an integer. So I get. Now I'm getting what I'm wanting, which is integers when I parse an integer. So I'm getting that, the 1 and the 2, 3 there. We can expand on that. This one shows a, some recursion. In this case, I'm putting recursion around parentheses. So I have, when I encounter parentheses, I want to re recurse back to my original expression. Right now, I'm calling the expression just my integer. Uh, I'm going to keep expanding on that. But, but, and, and that's why I'm actually, this is just another way to do this recursion where I st start with an empty grammar and then shove it in to recurse. So we get, we can you know, parse what, however much of parentheses matching we need. And then this is an error condition because we got a mismatch on parentheses at this point. Then our next example, add in 
uh, a unary minus here. So in this case, it's we want if we see a negative, we don't we want to discard it because we don't really want the negative in the output stream. And then another primary, and then here's our action. In this case, I'm going to negate what's on the last part of the output stream and, and then put it back. And then, or it can just be a plain old primary itself. And then this, this shows a few examples. Expanding, we get here, I'm going to showing that some left recursion, because the, the product here is on the, the left side. Again, so if we see product and then times another unary, then we, then we put uh, the, the product of the two on back onto, the, onto our output stream. And then this is the, the last one. So then I just added another level doing sum. So our, our, final, um, our, our final expression is basically a, a sum contains terms that have products in them. And then the product might have a unary in that. The unary might have parentheses. Then that could have any, anything. And then another expression, or an integer. So this is kind of our final. Um, grammar for an expression. And then there's, here's some, some examples here of, of using that thing. In this case, I'm taking this expression and I'm evaluating it. But it could be also putting, putting it in a tree instead, just by changing the actions. But the, the actions that I gave made it do evaluation. But it could be arbitrary. You could do, do whatever you want. So I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. So I mentioned this grammar engine uh, before. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, grammar engine, you could think of it as a visitor on top of the, the grammar. So we, the grammar that we're dealing with is, is, a, is a big tree of grammars. And what the engine's, the engine's job is, traverse, is to traverse that grammar and do something with it. Um, it can, can do anything, but the typical use is to generate a parser. So, um, and here, right now, the, I've implemented three engines, actually one, one more, but th three of them are here. Um, one of them is called, I call Ruby Zero, and that one, um, doesn't really generate a parser. It just, when it traverses the grammar, it parses at that time instead of generating a parser. Yeah, the next one, Ruby, it, it generates a Ruby parser. And then, you, it, and then you take that and parse later. Um, and I have another one that is derived from that that compiles to C. So we get, we get a performance boost there. Um, and then here's a few more ideas what we could do with, with uh, making other engines. I could, we could have something that generates C code instead. Have something that generates native um, or Ruby C code, and then one that generates native C++ code. And other ones, it doesn't have to do, it also doesn't have to do parser generation. We could generate a dot diagram instead. It parses the grammar tree, generates a dot diagram. And the other thing is, this, this whole grammar layer is a very, very lightweight layer. It, it's basically just a user layer. All the work is done by the engine itself. And there's nothing that actually says that this, the engine has to be an LL parser either. So I could embed underneath, as an engine, an LR, LR parser, a pack rack parser, or something else. Because um, it's the, that, like I said, that layer is, is just to help you Build, um, build your grammar in a nice DSL-friendly way. It, it, it basically creates all the uh, operator overloading, creates a nice layer. So um, if you've noticed in the, um, in the previous examples, the action blocks, 
Um, they look like straight Ruby code, but they, they are, but they don't do what you're thinking they do. Um, and the reason is because these action blocks, they have to generate code, because I'm doing parser generation. Um, and so if you have a plain old Ruby object, I have to, you have to send it through this uh, brackets method to get a piece of code that I can be used for generate. I, I can use to, to do parser generation. Um, method calls, on the other hand, any method calls inside of one of these blocks, though, they just work. They don't do what you expect. And they, they don't execute the code immediately. And so when you see a, um, let, let me go back to this example here. So when we saw, this is a simple example here, this guy right here, S to I, it actually didn't do convert the string to an integer at that time when it executed the Ruby block. What it did is it generated a piece of code that said string S to I. So it kind of, and that's what all these things are doing. They're actually generating code and not executing right there. And the way I'm doing it is I, make, I had a class that override, overrides method missing to generate a piece of code that uses that operator. So it's, it's kind of it's a, a neat little trick there with the method missing. But it, it really only helps me, unfortunately, with just method calls. So anything else, um, I, I can't use those types of tricks. So like, like I said, with raw objects, I have to use a brackets method. And then any built-in Ruby constructs, I have to use some facilities of the engine to do, to do the code generation. Because I don't want to execute those things right that, that, at that time. I want to generate the code that does that. So for example, if, I have an, if you want an if statement, you have to use the if method out of the engine. Or, or the or operator, same thing. Or even semicolon, a sequence of things. You have to use steps. Um, I also have uh, the, 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 the uh, variables grammar. That can be used to create variables, share them between multiple grammars. And you can create some kind of state that you need to. Um, that actually allows you to do, do um, context-sensitive context parsers, which most parsers can only handle context-free. So this, you could put arbitrary state and cause these actions to affect parsing decisions. So it, it kind of removes a, a, a normal limitation that other parsers have. So here is performance comparing. I did a performance analysis of um, several parsers out there that I found in Ruby. Um, I think that down here, other than this, this bottom one here, this grammar Ruby 0, these, the ones on the bottom here, I believe, are pack rat parsers. Um, and this, this is, uh, I, all, I wrote JSON parsers for all these, all these different these different uh, parser generators. And this is basically, you know, how many characters per second it's going through this, the, these big, this big piece of JSON code that I, that I generated. Um, but you see, um, yeah, the PackRat parsers typically aren't doing too good. Um, here's Rack. This is the straight Ruby version. The C extension gives you a little more speed. This grammar slash Ruby here, here, this is my pure Ruby implementation. So it's, it's, it's faster than still rack with a C extension. That's the pure Ruby version. And it's getting close to what um, my hand-coded um, parser did. This is, this is a one character at a time hand-coded parser. This one right here is one where I, I believe I started with uh, James, James Gray's um, version. This, a lot of this came from uh, one of the Ruby quizzes. But I started with his and optimized it as much as I could. Um, 
And then this, the one at the top here, I, that's when compiled it to C. So we get, and then the very top, that is pure C. That's a pure C extension that um, is, is just meant for JSON parsing. So getting closer to that one, but not quite. But I, I don't think you'll find any other Ruby parsers that are going to be this fast. Or Ruby parser generators, rather. I think I missed a few slides. Yeah, I did. OK. So here, uh, we just wanted to talk about some of the, the lessons I've learned so far um, writing this, this, uh, this code, this grammar code. One thing is duct type. Duct typing is, is your friend. And it, it, add, it can add a lot of flexibility. Um, here are some of the, the concepts where I use duct typing. So my input sequence, output sequence, I used it on my, to, to do pattern matching on my, on my elements. Um, yeah, I, I, and I discussed earlier how I, how I was doing the, the code generation. That's, that's all duct typed. So um, it allows you to use a lot more than you might if you, you were thinking just, just using the specific thing. Also, when I'm using duct typing, um, to extend the flexibility further, I typically try to limit it, limit the number of methods I use. So most of these, I actually just use one method, and that's it. The best method to use is probably um, either call or brackets, and then it looks like a lambda. And then you can use, it, a lambda is probably the easiest to use with that. Um, another thing that was useful is layering. Um, putting a layer between this, my grammar and my engine, it added a whole lot of flexibility. My previous incarnation of this thing, the engine was part of the grammar as one piece, and I had, a, had very limited flexibility on that. Now I've opened it up by separating out the two. Because now I can plug in any old engine I want, and make a new engine to work with this. Um, prototyping was also useful. If you notice in this, this previous slide here, um, this Ruby zero was at the bottom of the list there. And that was my prototype. So that one didn't do code generation at all. It just, ex it parsed, I mean, it, it traversed the grammar tree, and while it was traversing, it would do parsing. So it was slow because it didn't have this parser generation stage, but it was a good prototype. It allowed me to prototype the whole API. And then later I came along, built a new engine that did, that did full uh, code generation. And that's where I got my speed there. And then, uh, yeah, I would, I would suggest, yeah, use lambdas and blocks liberally. They're, they. They add a lot of flexibility. Um, oh, and, and another thing, initially, when I was making the, the methods in this grammar, I would um, typically try to make one method do a whole bunch of things for me. So I did, had nice short names for methods. Um, fortunately, that just caused too much trouble than it was really worth. And so I found that if you can come up with a, a way where each method is just as simple as possible, and it's e you can document it easily, it's easier to debug, um, and it also provides performance benefit. So I, I, would, I, I think it's better to minimize your overloading and just have nice, simple methods instead of trying to jam everything into these complex methods. That the only benefit you get is, is you get to reuse a name. That's really your benefit. And I don't think it's worth it. Here are some of the um, some of my lessons learned to get the performance numbers I was getting previously. Uh, minimize object creation. That that helps out a lot. And minimize method calls. As you can see, the um, the parsers that I generate they're almost completely flat. 
Um, I'll, actually, I'll, sh I'll show you one, one of them in a bit. Um, don't repeat yourself. And for performance, you just make sure in your code sequence, don't make the same decisions multiple times. Um, and then, I kind of already alluded to this earlier, keep, keep things simple so, so that you're, when you're doing the simple common stuff, they don't have to go through all this extra overhead. So I meant to do this one earlier. Let me go back to this example. Um, and show you some code like this primary here. So this was one of the examples I gave. And this I'm spitting out the, the code that it generates. So this one is, uh, I'll show you the example. This test unary. So we have some parses a digit and or, I'm sorry, let's go back to prim I mean primary. Parses a digit or it can start with parentheses and recurse back to itself. So that's the example I want to just show here. So here I'm, I'm just calling this method. That's the, this is the main this is the main piece of uh, the main code that you call first, and then this is calling this guy, and then here it is up here. So it, it first parses a di parses a, di a digit, and then possibly more. You, you notice here that you, in the grammar you specified. Uh, like question mark zero, question mark nine here to represent characters. But the code is a, has a little bit of ugliness here because those are just fixed nums. So this is 48 is ASCII for, for zero. 57 is ASCII nine. So this one looks for a digit, then more digits. If it wasn't if it wasn't a digit, then it goes down to another, the alternative here, or a left paren. And then it calls itself. And then right paren. So that's, that's kind of an example there. I believe that's it. That's where the project's at. A Ruby Forge. So that's all I had. Yeah, any, any questions? Yes? You looked at like Yambit C, it's like sort of what you were What was, what you? Yambit C. Yambit C? Yeah, I haven't heard of that one. Right. No, I haven't heard of that. Was this is that a uh, gem package or what is it? No, it's a scheme. It's a oh, it's for scheme. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I haven't I, I haven't heard of that. Um, I've one of the, one of the other parser packages that I can't think is similar is on C plus plus. It's called Spirit. That one, you, what's that? Boost. From Boost. That's right. This is it's similar in that you. It's similar to Spirit in that you write the grammar in the same language. But this one, this one still has, this has quite a bit more flexibility than that. Anybody else? Yes? So uh, I saw some discussion where you said there was something that grammar was going to do that was special, that was different than all the other parsers. Mm -hmm. left, recur left recursion? Left recursion. Yes. Yes, it's, um, I believe there's, the only place I saw it was in a, um, it's in one of the functional languages that did that. And it, but it did it in a completely different manner. I think they counted the number of tokens until the end of the sequence. And then based on that count, they would limit the recursion. So they, they would actually do, 
do recursion at that point, but limit the depth of recursion. Normally, if you, with an LL parser or a recursive descent parser, left recursion implies infinite, an infinite loop, and you never get out of it. So that's what's kind of unique about what I'm doing. Yeah? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, very good question, because <laughs> um, I, I did have this working at one time, with, but I changed some code, and now it, it seems to be broken with 1.9. But it, um, yeah, so with uh, Ruby 1.9, when you, when you're, if you're dealing with a string, when you're parsing the characters, the, those characters are also strings. Um, previously, I did have it working, and it, 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 the code it generated just simply had strings instead of fixed nums. So it did work. Um, you don't get the performance, as much of a performance benefit, because they're strings, because they're full objects. Um, but the latest Ruby 1.9 seemed not, it wasn't, wasn't horrible. Before that, it was, it was very bad. Um, but it, it looks like it'll still work. And the code will actually be a lot more readable because you won't have ASCII <coughs> values in there. It'll have real strings. But you're not going to necessarily leverage any of the performance gains for 1.9. Yeah, I, I did, I did, when I had it working before in 1.9, it, it was still a little bit faster than um, in the table I had there. Um, but I know when you compile, I don't think that the Ruby to C extension isn't working at 1.9. But I know it wouldn't comp you wouldn't get nearly that performance benefit going to going to C because um, fixed nums you can you can optimize quite a bit. So yes. Uh, are there any other projects you know that are using grammar? Um, I, know, I know I've encountered some Ruby projects that are. That they definitely have their own for example. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know of any that are using that? No, I don't. Yeah, I just, I just released this uh, okay. last night. Oh. <laughs> so I had a, this is version, what I discussed here is version 0.8, um, which I just released. Yeah. If, you, if we go back to this, let me go back to that chart. So you see grammar 0.5. Yeah. That's what yesterday. That was what was there. Just 0.5. So grammar 0.8 is the are the other ones. So yeah, I had there the, the, comparing the pure Ruby version. There's a 5x speed up from going to from one version to the next. So and this add, I know this this one adds a lot more flexibility because the previous one I didn't have that the layering between engine and grammar. So, yeah, but I don't, I don't know of anybody yet. Okay. Yes? Yeah, I was curious about your motivation in writing grammar. So did you have a particular something you needed to parse that you were interested in, or is it more kind of a curiosity? Um, it started that way. <laughs> um, uh, my, my background is, is uh, IC design, microprocessor design. And that, so I deal with lot, I dealt with lots of formats and um, I think at, at the time, at the time, I was kind of going off on my own. I wanted to start my own company. I didn't get very far though, <laughs> but uh, I just got interested in doing this because I was wanting to, I was first wanting to parse something, and then I got sidetracked and did this whole thing. <laughs> yes. Any size limits on the way you've implemented it? Because most of the parsers pro bar and the large files that throw at it. No. This is, it, uh, it, it just depends on what you want to put in your syntax tree. In terms of the in, storing the input itself, it doesn't store anything. The, well, except for one case. If you call the backtrack method, then it has to buffer the input it's from that point. And then once it goes back, then it can wipe the buffer clean. But when it, yeah, it, it could handle you know, gigabyte files. So you can throw a video stream at it. Yeah, it just depends. If you let's say you have, you know, you have terabytes of a huge um, expression, and you're doing that piece of code that I showed earlier, that one would use almost no memory because it's it's not generating anything. It's just constantly 
um, evaluating expression. That's all it's doing. So there's no tree involved. If you generate a parse tree, then the parse tree would take memory. But that would be it. Anybody else? Well, thank you. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.